welcome to this week's Movie Math, where not one, but three movies got their ass kicked. You know, for all the talk about violence in movies, there is little talk about movie-on-movie -movie violence, a growing epidemic at the box office. On that note, R.I.P. Paranoia, which debuted outside of the top ten, with about a million for each percent it got on Rotten Tomatoes. It was a brutal slaughter that likely eliminated Liam Hemsworth's career as well, with Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman suffering deep wounds to their images, yet ironically only surviving because of their iconic statuses. The only one to probably emerge unscathed is Amber Heard, who has fortified a tabloid stronghold by claiming to be bisexual and making the rounds with girlfriend Tazia Van Rie, that is until she got an offer to be Johnny Depp's girlfriend. Angelina Jolie is perhaps most famous for using the same game plan, yet Evan Rachel Wood has gotten some mileage out of it as well. Now while paranoia was left for dead, at least Jobs was still breathing at number seven. Thankfully, the film was so cheap to make that it should be able to turn a profit, but star Ashton Kutcher has got to be gutted that this is the second lowest debut of his entire career. With Only My Boss's Daughter, where he starred, and I use the term loosely, opposite Tara Reid in 2003. This is such a poor debut that Sony should really consider moving forward with their own Steve Jobs bio as planned, as it doesn't look like it will take much for audiences to forget Jobs. In fact, it seems few ever thought about it at all. And it looks like Kick-Ass and Hit-Girl really should consider retiring, as their sequel not only debuted in fourth place, but far behind the original as well. Did Jim Carrey really do that much damage? Or should Chloe Moretz have worked harder to promote the film? As I pointed out in my review, she decided to skip Comic-Con this year. Or maybe it was the dismal reviews. But even more horrifying is the idea that audiences might be burnt out on superhero movies. We'll get a clearer picture in November when Thor faces off with Bad Grandpa, Ender's Game, The Wolf of Wall Street, and Catching Fire on the box office battlefield. There was one lone survivor this weekend, and that was Lee Daniels, the butler. Hollywood was stunned, stunned by its success, continuing to prove that most studio executives must be throwing darts at the release schedule blindfolded for all they seem to know. As I pointed out in last week's movie math, the butler clearly had an excellent shot of taking the number one spot, considering the success of The Help two years ago in the exact same frame, the second weekend of August. Then you factor in that the butler is an obvious crowd pleaser, following in the footsteps of not just The Help, but also 1989's Driving Miss Daisy. Both those flicks slowly but truly raked up not just box office cash, but awards nominations and wins. The help held steady for weeks back in 2011 and even surged during Labor Day weekend. If the butler can do the same, then well, I'm afraid that's likely all she wrote for similarly themed Mandela in 12 Years a Slave. In the comment section of my review for the butler, some viewers wondered when women's rights would be tackled on the silver screen. Good question. Civil rights is experiencing a cinematic renaissance because more and more black filmmakers, writers, and producers are gaining ground in Hollywood. However, I would argue that the initial inroads for them were made by talent that insisted on playing dignified roles. Meanwhile, actresses continue to be rewarded not for taking risks with their craft, but for literally exposing themselves sexually, thus Seth MacFarlane's infamous We Saw Your Boob song at last year's Oscars. Last year, Daniel Day-Lewis won an Oscar for playing the 16th President of the United States, and Christoph Waltz for a bounty hunter disgusted by the injustice of slavery. In comparison, Jennifer Lawrence won her Oscar for playing the girlfriend of the lead character who proudly admits she was fired for having sex with all the men and women at her office. And Anne Hathaway won her Oscar for playing a woman fired from her job because she wouldn't sleep with the foreman and ended up becoming a prostitute. Now, I'm not saying Lawrence and Hathaway didn't do a good job, but we're stuck in an endless cycle where the Academy refuses to let actresses break the Hollywood stereotype, so actresses are forced to play into that very stereotype if they want to further their careers. Due to the tremendous purchase power of audiences in Asia and the Latino market globally, I fear women will be the last demographic to be respectfully recognized on the screen, if at all. But then, look at all the success Jennifer Aniston is having as a stripper. Where the Millers dropped just about 30% in its second weekend, holding on to the number two spot and so far outgrossing every other movie in the top ten except for The Wolverine. It's hard to argue against cold hard cash, even when it's singles tucked under a thong strap. As for this coming weekend, it doesn't look like The Butler has much competition. Mortal Instruments, debuting on Wednesday, seems to be the next teen genre romance to aim for Twilight's success and fall short, while your next will make some fast, easy money as cheap horror films tend to do. As for The World's End, it's actually expected to be a high point for Peg and Company, so good news there. And that's the weekend box office. I'm Grace Randolph, and we just did some movie math. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope you'll go beyond the trailer for these other top movies.